Is Jesus really God? If he is, it's one of the most important questions that we can ask and one of the most important answers that we need to know. If he is not God, then he can be safely ignored. There's no long-term implications. If Jesus is not who he claimed to be, if he's not who the Bible says that he is, if he's not who Christians today proclaim that he is, then he can be safely ignored. There's no consequences we need to worry about. What we said all along in this series on Explore God is it's not merely an intellectual exercise. There are important questions for us to ask. And in the God who put the brain in our heads expects us to use it. And so I want to encourage you to do just that. But fundamentally, these are not intellectual questions. You know what this really is? This is a love story. Is Jesus really God? If he is, it's a love story. You and I have been changed probably most often by love stories that we hear about. They have the power to help us rethink the entirety of our lives. And real love, when you and I are confronted by real love, not sentimental love, not sappy love, not I love you because you're doing all these wonderful things for me, I love you because you're attractive, and the moment those shallow things ends, love ends. But true love, deep love, sacrificial love, those things move us like nothing else. And the reason they do is because they, they give us a glimpse of what God is like and the love that he has for us. Unfortunately, I can think of several examples that I've heard of over the, the years of my life where I have seen this kind of love. And the reason why I say it's unfortunate is because usually that kind of love shows up in the midst of, of some kind of tragedy or unfaithfulness in marriage. I still remember the story of one couple. They became estranged in their marriage and the wife began a relationship with somebody uh, that she knew at work and that went on for a long time. Finally, it was exposed. She felt, by God's grace, remorseful. She went and told her husband and as they were, they videotaped uh, uh, their story so that other people could learn from it. And the words that he said, I'll, I'll never forget. He said, I delight to show her grace. I delight to forgive her. And many wives have said that to their husbands as well. It's one of the most powerful ones I remember back probably 25 years ago, hearing a, a couple speak in church. And the husband got up first and he acknowledged that, that for the two decades or more that he and his wife had been together, there had not been a single year he had been faithful to her. And when she told him that, I mean, you can imagine how she felt. I mean, she thought he was the ideal husband. He actually was active in their church. He was teaching Sunday school. An all-around nice guy. Everybody loved him. Hadn't been faithful to her in the more, more than two decades that they were together. And she kept telling him, as he was telling her this, I love you, I love you. And she went down, downstairs after he had told her this, and he said, she, uh, she prayed, and she said, Lord, I can forgive him, and I can, I, can, I can stay with him. But I could never be with him again. I could never be with him as a wife. And I think most of us, when we heard that, thought, no, that's, that's, that's probably right. That's what I would say. And the, the Lord impressed upon her a verse from the book of Acts, and he said to her, what I have called clean, do not call unclean. That is the love of God. And if you and I don't understand that really the answer to the question, is Jesus really God, it's not an intellectual yes or no. And the answer is yes. But it's not just an intellectual question. It is a love story. Because we can't separate who Jesus really is from why he came. And there is broad acknowledgement that Jesus lived and walked on earth. Even people who don't believe that he's God. History is pretty clear about that. So understanding why Jesus came is important to understanding who he is. The two of them are really inseparable. 
And perhaps the most famous verse in all of Scripture says just that, right? John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The love of God is the fuel upon which this world runs. And once we understand that, it gives us an entirely new understanding of who Jesus is. There are many different ways to demonstrate that Jesus is really God. And I want to talk about three different things this morning that I hope, they're, they're not the only three things I could have talked about, but I hope that these three things that you will find pretty compelling. And they are this. Number one is the clear teaching of the Bible. Number two, the changed lives of Jesus' followers. And then thirdly, the character and the ministry of Jesus. Those three things, individually and then taken together, help us to understand that there is a strong, a compelling case to be made, not only from God's word, but beyond, that Jesus is who he claimed to be, who his followers said that he was, and who millions of people across the world now know that he is. Now today, we are assuming that the Bible is true. And some of you may be saying, well, is the Bible really reliable? Well, come back next Sunday, because that's the question we're going to ask and answer then. Uh, Dr. Erwin Lutzer, our pastor emeritus, will be addressing that question. You may know that he wrote a book, Seven Reasons Why You Can Trust the Bible. And so today, I get to assume all of that's true. Those of you who are skeptical about that, again, please come back next Sunday. You'll have an opportunity to hear why we believe that. Well, there's a lot of passages to focus on. I want to just focus on one. We've already read parts of it this morning in John chapter 1 because it's such a compelling passage that talks about the deity of Jesus. Let's look at it again. In the beginning was the Word. John's going to later on say that this, is, this Word is, is Jesus Christ. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. They were eyewitnesses. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. That scripture is packed full of reasons to believe that the clear teaching of scripture is that Jesus is the Son of God. He is God himself. Jesus is the Word. This passage tells us that Jesus was with God, meaning that he existed co-eternally. He's always been with God the Father. Jesus was God and is God. What John is getting at here is the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Three persons, one God. Yes, a mystery to us, but that's what Scripture teaches. The Word, Jesus, created everything, which is what the Bible says God did. The Word, Jesus, became human. He took on flesh. He dwelt among us. It's what the Bible, what we call the incarnation, God with us. The name Emmanuel means God with us. Jesus' glory, a glory unique to God, was on display. And the qualities of that, John writes, are grace and truth. Grace and truth. And then finally, Jesus makes the invisible God known. No one has ever seen God, John writes. But God, who is at his side, the Word, Jesus, has made God known to us. In your bulletin is an insert that if you take a look at it, you'll realize that we do not have time to go through it. But I wanted you to have this. This is from uh, Murray Harris. It is a, uh, not an exhaustive by any means, but it is an outline of Scripture that testify to the deity, the Godhood of Jesus. And it begins with what they call implicit Christology. Christology is the study of Christ. What is implied about him in Scripture, 
related to his deity, and then explicit Christology, what is explicitly referred to about Jesus being God. It begins with divine functions performed by Jesus, and just want to kind of run through those kind of quickly for you. You've got things like he's the creator, as we saw in our passage. He is the sustainer of all life. Jesus is the ruler. He is the healer, the forgiver of sins, the grantor of salvation. He raises the dead, and he will judge. The qualities that are referred to about God referred to by Jesus as well. Next is divine status that was claimed by or accorded to Jesus. He possessed divine attributes. We see this in John 1, verse 4. He existed eternally, again in our passage. Equal in dignity with the Father. Perfectly reveals the Father, John 1, 18. He receives praise and worship. He receives prayer and is a joint source of blessing with the Father. On explicit Christology, there's so many things that could be said. There's many Old Testament passages that refer to, to Yahweh, to God. that are then applied to Jesus. And there are d divine titles that are either claimed by Jesus or used by Jesus. Son of man, son of God, Messiah, Lord, and God. But the point here is that Scripture's testimony to the deity of Christ, I think you can define it in three different ways. It is consistent. It is, it is all throughout Scripture, from the, from really from the beginning to the end, once you understand how the New Testament writers uh, help us to understand the Old Testament. So it is consistent throughout. It is compelling. Now, I realize I, write, I say that as a pastor and as a, as a Christian, but when you read God's Word and you see how Jesus is referred to as God, how he claims to be God, and all that he does and says, it is a very compelling presentation. It's not sort of a, a casual one. And then finally, it's critical. And we'll see this a little bit later on, but the fact that Jesus is God is critical to everything. Because if Jesus is not God, he could not be the savior of the world. And this love story would end tragically. There would be no salvation for anyone if Jesus was not God. It's clear, it's consistent, it's compelling, and it's critical. I would urge you to go through this insert. Like I said, it's not exhaustive, but if you take the time to look through this, and say, what does the Bible actually say about who Jesus is? I think one of the most ridiculous comments people could make is that the Bible doesn't proclaim that Jesus is God. Because Jesus doesn't get up somewhere and say, I am God. But it's why the Jews wanted to kill him. They understood exactly what he was saying. So the second point is this. The changed lives of Jesus' followers. I personally find this compelling. If you were to claim, as we do, that Jesus is God, then he should have a powerful impact on the lives of everyone around him, shouldn't he? I mean, if Jesus was God in human form, the creator of the universe, the one who created everyone, the one who created his own mother, then you would expect him to have a unique impact on people, wouldn't you? I mean, I'm sure that there were many wonderful, amazing, even influential people throughout history, and we know nothing about them because their impact was pretty small. Jesus' impact 2,000 years later is not small at all. I remember now, probably about 30 years ago, I was at the airport in Los Angeles. I was uh, in school out there, and not terribly far away from me, maybe, maybe it was 20 feet, uh, there was a well-known actress, uh, at least an Academy Award nominated if she didn't win. Uh, I didn't research that for this part. Uh, and I looked at her and noticed who she was, and she looked at me, and she smi I smiled, and she smiled back. Now, we haven't kept in touch <laughs> since then. But... I'll never forget that. That was one of my few brushes with fame. And for some reason, that's, that's one of those things that's always going to stick with me. But it didn't really have any impact on my life. I don't think about Glenn Close often when I uh, go through my life. And I'm confident Glenn doesn't think much about me anymore either. But Jesus' impact on people, if he was God, what would you expect? You would expect it to be powerful. In fact, there's, there's three terms I want to, four terms actually I want to use. One, you'd expect it to be pervasive. You would expect it to be perpetual, powerful, and personal. And I used all P's because I'm hoping that you help, that helps you remember a little bit, right? It was pervasive, perpetual, 
powerful, and personal. What do I mean by that? Well, pervasive. Several years ago, Moody Church did a, a survey of our church family and found that there are more than 70 different nations of origin represented here. If Jesus is God, if he is the Son of God, if he came to earth as a love story to rescue people, then you would expect that that would not just be true of a small group of people that spoke maybe one language somewhere in one part of the globe. What you find is that from the very beginning, that God's plan was to use one nation, Israel, to reach every nation so that every nation would be blessed. Every nation would have the opportunity to know who God is. And in that regard, it is pervasive. Christians are all over the world. And it bothers some people so much that it's illegal to tell people about Jesus. It's illegal to own a Bible. And if that wasn't the case, the gospel would spread even further. It is all over the world. And our one church here in Chicago is, is just a little glimpse of that. I mean, if you think about that, Christianity is not bound by culture. Most of the main world religions are. Number two, it's perpetual. In other words, from, from Jesus' first disciples, those who actually could see him and could hold him and could talk to him, their lives were radically changed. Almost every single one of Jesus' disciples ultimately gave his life for Jesus. They believed who he claimed to be. They doubted at times in the beginning, but once Jesus died and rose again and appeared to them, they were convinced their lives were changed. And now 2,000 years later, 2,000 years after Jesus died on the cross for his people, there are people all over the world dying for Jesus. They are willing to give their lives because they know that he is the Son of God. He is their Savior. He is their Lord. That is a compelling truth. 2,000 years later, I've never seen him. I've never heard of him. I, I don't know what Jesus looks like. Neither do you. But there's no doubt. I have no doubt that Jesus is God. I have no doubt that Jesus is who he claimed to be because Jesus has changed my life 2,000 years later. And many of you can testify to the same thing. He even said, blessed are those who love me who have not seen me. No one else has had that kind of impact. 2,000 years later. Third, it's powerful. When Jesus comes into someone's life, he doesn't just kind of fix it a little bit, make a few changes here and there, essentially the same person. Jesus radically transforms people's lives. Now, it's true, you're probably thinking, I know Christians, uh, the radical transformation hasn't really happened yet. It is a process. And you've got to keep in mind what God actually had to start with. For some of us, God started really, really far back, right? And he's got a lot more work just to bring us up to kind of average. But the lives that Jesus has changed, the complete perspective that's different, the desires that are different, the pursuit of life that is different. The Bible actually says it's like you are born again. You're a new person. You are a new creation. That's the power of that change. Some of you who are here this morning or you're joining us online, you know a Christian whose life has been radically changed. I want you to ask them to explain why is that. How did you go from one direction in your life to another? My wife and I have very different uh, stories of coming to faith in Christ. I was about nine years old. I kind of grew up going to church. I never really doubted what I believed. And there was finally a point where I really trusted Jesus and understood who, that he is the son of God. He is my savior, the one who could rescue me from my sins. And so there wasn't a real radical change in my life. My wife's testimony, though, which she actually has given in the church, uh, is very different. Her story is one of a more radical change. In fact, when she came to faith in Christ, that one night she started writing down all the sins that she committed that she had overlooked, all the things that she was insensitive to, the things that she said, well, everybody does these things. It's no big deal. And she was convicted of the Lord. Her whole perspective changed. Her view of herself, her view of her need before God, her view of who Jesus is, a powerful, undeniable testimony that happens all the time. And then finally, it's personal. I love this about the Lord. 
Every person who comes to understand who Jesus is and to place their faith and their trust in him for the forgiveness of their sins. This love story, Jesus is wooing them like a husband and they receive that and they yield to that. They have a different story. It's not as if the Lord waves his hand and everyone comes to him in the same way. He knows you personally. He knows the obstacles that you currently face to coming to faith in Jesus. He knows if you have hatred for him, if you just have profound bitterness, unbelievable sadness that you can't shake, if you have intellectual questions and doubts, he knows that about you. And your journey to trust him will be personal. So I would urge you to trust him. I want to like take a look at one powerful example in the Bible, and that is the Apostle Paul. In Acts chapter 8, verse 3, we read about this Paul when he was first called Saul. It says, but Saul was ravaging the church and entered house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. So before he came to know who Jesus was, before he encountered him, his position toward Jesus and Jesus' his followers, they should be killed. First thing we hear about, about Saul was he was at the execution of Stephen, one of Jesus' his followers, and he was in hearty agreement, the Bible says, with his execution. Well, then later, in a letter that he wrote to the church in Corinth, 1 Corinthians 15, 9, this is what he says. For I am the least of the apostles, that I am not, that I am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. He goes from thinking the most important and valuable thing that I can do is to persecute this Jesus and his followers and to execute them and to throw them into prison. And later on in his life, it's a complete 180. He realizes, I'm not even worthy to be called an apostle. I am the chief of sinners because I persecuted the church of God. I went after Jesus and his followers. Look what he says in Philippians 3, verses 7 through 11. Again, it illustrates after he came to faith in Christ how he saw that change. He said, but whatever were gains to me in the past, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. And this is what he says. Not I want to persecute Christians anymore. Not I believe that they're all a bunch of liars and Jesus is a fraud. I want to know Christ. To what extent? Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. That's a transformation, isn't it? That's someone who was born again. That's someone who was a new creation. That's the power of the gospel, the power of changed lives that, bring, that Jesus brings into a person's life. Paul went from valuing things that were of highest value to him, and he said they're nothing compared to knowing Jesus. That's one of the desires that Jesus puts within us, to know the God who created us, to explore and to grow in the relationship that you and I were created for. You know, it's, it's actually a mark of those who say that, who would affirm gladly, Jesus is God. But then if they were honest, they'd say, it doesn't make any difference in my life. I mean, I'm, I'm happy to know a little bit more about him. I'm not going to seek him. If they were honest, that's what they would say. That's not what Paul said. The things that were most important to me now, I consider them garbage. I consider them losses because they didn't bring him closer to the Lord. For him, it was a bunch of, of uh, spiritual things, a bunch of privileges being a, being a Jew. For us, it could be status. It could be power. It, it could be wealth. It could be any number of things. And he went from inflicting harm on the church to welcoming it himself because it knew that that was a way that he could know the Lord better. I mean, you talk about a dramatic change. Not all of us, like I said, go from, from one extreme to the other. Wherever God takes us, eventually we're going to get to that extreme, if you want to call it that, where our passion is to know God. We've all had friends that have encouraged us to do things, right? We've had friends encourage us on, on a positive side that we should work out more, we should eat better, we should quit smoking, we should do better in school. 
Those are wonderful things. People can make a big difference in our lives. Nobody can make a powerful, fundamental change in someone's life like Jesus can. There's a uh, statement from an early church leader. He says this, if the incarnation did not happen, if Jesus was not God come in human form, if that did not really happen, then an even more unbelievable miracle happened. So let's assume it didn't happen. He's saying, an even more unbelievable miracle happened. The conversion of the world by the biggest lie in history and the moral transformation of lives into unselfishness, detachment from worldly pleasures, and radically new heights of holiness by a mere myth. And I think that takes more faith to believe than Jesus is who he claimed to be. He changes the lives of everyone he encounters, and he's still doing that today. Third, the character and the ministry of Jesus. The clear teaching of the Bible, the changed lives of Jesus, his followers, and now the character and ministry of Jesus. Who is Jesus? And there are three things about this study, his character, his ministry, and his resurrection, I think demonstrate biblically that we can have confidence that Jesus is God. The first is this, his character. Jesus, the Bible says, was without sin. He was completely obedient to God the Father. None of us can say that, not even close. Hebrews 4 says this, verses 14 through 15. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. That's a bold statement to make. It's true of Jesus. He never sinned. He perfectly obeyed God the Father. And so he could take on the role of high priest because in dying for us, he wasn't dying to pay for his own sin. As a sinless person, he had nothing to atone for. But also being both 100% God, 100% man, he is able to be the mediator between us and God and take on the full weight of the sin of every individual man, woman, and child who places their trust in him. Jesus understands us more than we know. He is sympathetic with sinners. That's part of the love story. He doesn't come just to beat us up, just to make us feel worse. He comes to extend his love. And he sympathizes with us. Next is his ministry. And unfortunately, we don't have enough time to go through all this, obviously. The entire Bible goes through that, so I encourage you to read it. His teaching, his miracles, his, his bold claims. Let me just look at one. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 through 15. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, that's us, he himself likewise partook of the same things. Why? That through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. That answers the question why. That's another way of putting the love story of Jesus, that he came in order to defeat death, our greatest enemy. That's it. That's it. That was his ministry. The name Jesus means God saves. He came to destroy the devil. He came to deliver those who were enslaved to a fear of death all their lives, and that's all of us. If we're not masking it in some way, and only he could do it. He needed to be God, and he needed to be man. You know, one final question is, did Jesus claim to be God? Did Jesus claim to be God? In John chapter 14, Jesus is talking to his disciples and he's, he's encouraging them. He's, he's saying that he's, he's, he's going to go away. But in this really incredible passage, what you see is, you see the doubt of the disciples, in particular uh, Thomas. He's saying, you know, Jesus is saying, I, I'm going to go away, but you know where I'm going. I'm going to come back and I'm going to prepare for you a place for us to be together in heaven forever. And Thomas is like, I, I, I don't know. Where, where? Where? Where are you going? We don't, we don't know the way. And this is, this is what he says. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know me and have seen me. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? 
The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. It's condescending to the, to the doubts of the disciples, even our own doubts. Jesus identified himself with the Father. And as I said, that's why the Jews wanted to kill him. They understood exactly what Jesus was claiming. Jesus connected who he is, one with the Father, to his mission. I'm going to prepare a place for you, that you might be with me forever. And Jesus backs up his words by the works of his ministry. Finally, his resurrection. One of the most important things, and we could preach a series of messages on his resurrection, right? If Jesus is the Son of God, death can't hold him. And it couldn't. Look at uh, Mark 8, 31. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. Michael Best had a quote last week I want to, I want to uh, repeat because I think it, it speaks so perfectly. There's a, a, a different pastor who said, if a man can predict his own death and resurrection and pull it off, I just go with whatever that man says. I mean, that seems fair, doesn't it? I mean, think about that. Jesus is telling his disciples, this is what's going to happen. His death wasn't an accident, wasn't a tragedy. It was his mission. It was all part of the love story to rescue people for himself, those who would trust him and ask for forgiveness. Jesus' sinless character, his ministry, his miracles, his teaching, his resurrection, all help us to understand that he is who he claimed to be. He is the Son of God who came to the world to save sinners. There's a quote that many of you are probably familiar with by C.S. Lewis, and it addresses a common error. It's certainly an error. It's more than that. That existed in his day, he would have written this in the uh, uh, 19, late 1950s, 1960s. He died in 1963. But it's one that you still hear today. If you were to uh, look online to find out, well, what do the other major religions say about Jesus? You see that they say good things about Jesus. They don't believe that he was the son of God in most cases. They don't believe that he died on the cross necessarily. But good teacher, good moral person, they say nice things about him. This is what C.S. Lewis has to say about that viewpoint. I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with the man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. Jesus is really God. And if he's not, we have no hope. There is no hope for salvation. Because every religion of the world essentially says the same thing. Do the best you can. Go through these rituals. And hope, hope that you're going to be okay on Judgment Day. Or hope that there's nothing awaiting you after you die. That's really all you have. Jesus came and said, you're not going to make it. I know you too well. Nothing you can do. I have to do it for you. I love you. For God so loved the world, he sent his only son to die on the cross to pay the penalty for the sin that separates us from God. He is the only mediator. He is the only savior. And so let me close with this. What now? What now? If you do not know Jesus, the Bible says this. 
In Deuteronomy 4.29, the Lord encourages people Israel after they would be exiled for their sin. But from there you will seek the Lord your God and you will find him if you search after him with all your heart and with all your soul. My friends, that promise is still true. God extends that promise to us today. If you seek him with your whole heart, you will find him. How might you do that? Pray. Just ask the Lord to help you know the truth. If, I think a lot of prayers of salvation began that way. Lord, I don't know. I don't know what to believe. Help me know who you are. Help me to know you. Read God's word. Start off with the Gospel of John, perhaps. Ask him, who are you? What do I need to have a relationship with you? Pray, read God's word. It's powerful to open your eyes and to change your heart. And then talk. Talk to someone on staff. Talk to a Christian you know. Ask them. Really ask them. Help me to understand who this Jesus is that you proclaim as God and who has so radically changed your life. If you do, if you seek him, he will be found by you because he loves you. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that the evidence that Jesus is your son, that Jesus is God, is all over your word. You're not silent. You have given us your word that we might know you. And it boldly and clearly and compellingly proclaims who Jesus is. And we thank you, Father, that for 2,000 years, Jesus has been changing lives. And we can see the impact of knowing Jesus. And we thank you, Father, for his character and his ministry. I pray, Lord, for everyone who hears this message, that we would be united together in Christ and be with you forever in heaven. We just thank you for your love in Christ's name. Amen.